And we are live, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to a reasonably fine art talk with just me, just Charlie Hunter. I had I had a very very special guest today, but uh, he had to reschedule. So uh, rather than I managed to not make a fool out of myself, I managed to not advertise my very very special guest and then have them not show up. Uh, so it all worked out great. I thought I'd talk a little about uh, stuff I've been working on lately, because I, I was looking back, I've now got like 88 of these uh, reasonably fine art talks. I'm quite proud of them, actually, because I don't spend a lot of time trying to sell my own stuff, uh, unlike a lot of things on the internet. Uh, of course, uh, if you check below, uh, visit hunterstudio.com to join my mailing list to get reasonably fine artist gear and discover the materials that I use. Um, and if you order off of my website, I get a little kickback from some of those affiliates, as it were. Um, and that's enough commercialization. I'm gonna hide that right now. That's gonna go away. And we'll just put this back up. The great Betty Sue, ladies and gentlemen, is off on the road. She is on tour with uh, James McMurtry, Two Nights in Tulsa, and then up through the Midwest. Then she's home for a little bit. Then she goes out on tour with her friend Bonnie Whitmore and Kim Ritchie, and they do another Midwestern tour. Then she drives directly from there to Tucson, Arizona to go out on tour with McMurtry up the West Coast and through the Pacific Northwest. She has what is called a busy summer ahead of her, ladies and gentlemen. I, meanwhile, am mostly just going to sit around with the cats and. Uh, Make a few forays to, I'll be judging Mountain Maryland plein air next week, ladies and gentlemen. If you're a contestant at Mountain Maryland plein air, send me $20 right now if you want to be sure of getting an award, because we're all about the greenbacks here. That's that's what we live for. Um, anyway, anyway, uh, I, oh, the other, other commercial things I want to say are this uh, coming Monday, uh, I will be doing an online demo with Penn Studio, Penn Studio School, uh, and information about that is at hunterstudio, hunter-studio.com under workshops. That's going to be an online demo about encaustics. If you're curious about my encaustic process, uh, I recommend you take this. I'll go through all the materials that I use, uh, what the setup is and how I use encaustic in my realism work. Uh, if, you, if you attend the workshop, you don't have to be there. You can watch it for three months uh, as much as you want after the workshop takes place. Uh, yeah. Oh, and the last thing I, I needed to get out of the way is Alla Prima. It has been at one person's house for quite a while now, and I want to get it moving again. Remember, we've got a copy of Richard Schmidt's Alla Prima 2. For people who are unsure if they want to spend the 100 bucks or 85 bucks for a copy, uh, so we just send it from one person who watches these to another. If you're interested in receiving it, you'd have it for about a month, and then we'll pass it, we'll ask you to send it on to the next person. Uh, if you're interested in that, just leave a comment. Uh, below and I will probably see it um, or send me a message again go to hunter-studio.com to the contact form and say send me a note saying yeah I'd like to, I'd like that Alla Prima I'd like to take a look at that for a month all right that's enough blathering about that in the old days ladies and gentlemen my uh, reasonably fine art talks used to only take about 20 minutes and they have become bloated affairs. They have become bloated affairs because I get into conversation with people and I get very, very interested in what we're talking about. Since I will only be talking to myself today, hopefully we can, we can get the time back down to kind of the more reasonable 25 minutes or so. So let come with me right now. Come to my studio, not really, but come to a slideshow of, of my studio or of what I've been working on in my studio. And I'll tell you about it. And thanks for being here today. All right. Oh, and now I'll go over to comments and people can leave comments. Hi, Lauren Davis. Hi, BA Humdinger. Um, anyway, uh, and if I'm able, I, if people have good questions, I will, um, 
I will try to answer them. I'll try to keep an eye on the comments. So, so on at my studio, this would be the setup for what I've been working on recently, which I call mono paintings, because they, they are kind of like mono prints in that you don't really know exactly what you're gonna be getting, uh, but they are still paintings. I use, as you can see, a variety of squeegees. The one with the blue handle is a six inch etere silicone blade uh, squeegee. The brass one is like a 12 inch, I think, uh, etere classic squeegee. And the great huge thing is one I got at the hardware store a couple months ago that is probably 18 inches. Um, it's really massive, and you'll see in a minute how I use it. Uh, then the two brushes I primarily use are these two watercolor brushes. The moppy black one, the black tipped one, the black haired one, and then the big brushy uh, rosemary watercolor brush with the black handle. Uh, that's pretty much it. Um, next slide, please. And here we have a close up of my working area. And in the tackle box in the background, uh, that's where I keep all my uh, watercolors, my tube watercolors. The glass palette is where I do the mixing. The two brushes are shown again. And I'm using Amsterdam acrylic ink. Uh, I'm using black and burnt sienna are the two that I'm, is that burnt sienna or burnt umber? I think it's burnt umber um, are the two that I've been using. And I like mixing them because the mix leaves a little bit of unpredictability uh, about where the color will be doing what. The warm brown warms up the black, obviously. And then I've got the Amsterdam acrylic binder container is full of clean water and the glass container is just full of kind of rinse water. Then I've got my spray, do it household spray bottle full with water. And I've got a toothbrush in case I feel like the need to clean my teeth. No, in case I feel the need to spatter things. All right. Yeah, the vacuum and the Swiffer do not get moving around here, Bill. They just live there. Um, this is, this is, we are in my office and my office is where all the brooms live. And God bless Jen Benware who comes every month and does a thorough house cleaning because I am not much of a housekeeper. I mean, I don't live in squalor, but uh, it gets a little rough around the edges. So this is, this is typical of what I try to do each day. I am showing you this suite of three pieces to show that uh, it, it's actually been very reassuring, ladies and gentlemen, because this process feels so natural to me. And when I go back into it after not having been doing it for a while, it, uh, it, it comes together so quickly. Then when I do several of them a day, for several days, they get worse and worse. And it is reassuring because if they stayed all being really good, then it would be too easy. It's very reassuring to, to discover that a process that is nominally extremely simple is actually very difficult to do well without overdoing. So here are the three mono paintings uh, and the one in the far background is good, I think. And the other two, I feel are overworked. The one in the foreground has some spatter that was done with the, uh, the uh, toothbrush. And the one in the middle, just I got too busy with, with my brushes. I got too smart for my own good. And I feel that the piece doesn't have enough of uh, simplicity. I'm going for this kind of stark, uh, awesome simplicity in these pieces. This is how I do them. I'm going to make my head go away uh, for a moment. Um, I put 
I, I take a block of watercolor paper generally, and I have several different types and I'm constantly experimenting with cold press, hot press, rough, smooth. And I think I'm right now I'm liking the rough best, but I've used it all up. So now I've got the smooth stuff, but I will take my brush, that big wide brush, brush out a very thin layer, uh, a thin pass in the vertical. And then I take the black, the black haired brush and draw and with a concentrated mix of the paint, draw a line across the bottom using the squeegee as the straight edge. Then I jiggle the squeegee a little bit. It leaves that interesting horizontal line. And the squeegee also has protected the area where I've been brushing. Uh, so it serves as both a straight edge and a, a frisket, basically. Now I'll make my head come back. And this is the setup. And this is the one I did yesterday that I was happy with. And we will see it uh, in its full in its full size in a minute. Um, so they are about, this is, I think, a nine, uh, about a nine by, a 12 by, 12 by, 12 by seven, maybe, no, 12 by eight uh, piece of watercolor paper that I found uh, that's the, the hot press, right? The rougher, the rougher surface. Um, I am astounded at how our eyes view these abstract marks made by pulling a squeegee and read it as something representational. This is the piece that I did. Now, on this one, I had that the big squeegee across the bottom protecting the paper. I took my, wa my wash brush and I did a wash across the, the top half of the painting, the top three quarters of the piece of paper. I let it kind of soak into the paper. Then I took the dark haired brush with a concentration of the ink, pulled it across the bottom, right? From right to left. You can see the where the brush went down is the darkest dark. And then I took the six inch squeegee and I pulled dry and I pulled up and it made those marks going from a continuous tone to then the, the there was no longer any liquid on a lot of the squeegee. And so it made those ghost marks coming upward. To me, this reminds me of being on the train across Canada of uh, going through kind of the Muskoka area, the, the Canadian shield, the, the pine trees, uh, and the windows not always being altogether clean. That's what that feels like to me. Note also how the black ink precipitates a little bit into the warmer brown before fading out. I think I, that makes me very happy. What also makes me very happy are the thin lines at the bottom. What I believe I did on this one was take the squeegee blade, press it against the, the, the wetness there. Oh, that was what it was. It was the squeegee that I pulled up, right? Then I tapped it into the wet, then I tapped it right below that. And that's the thin horizontal line. And then with the black haired brush, brushed a little to connect the big dark area with the thin area. So it breaks that up a little bit. Um, next slide, please, Charles. This one I like a lot. This is on the Arches uh, watercolor paper. There's a lot more of the brown ink in this, very, very dilute. Uh, this one, I blotted the sky a little bit with paper towel. Um, so I would have, Again, set the big squeegee at the bottom to give myself the horizon line, wet the whole paper, then taken, taken the brush, 
brushed across with the concentration of ink, either pulled up or down or across or brushed at the top with uh, a less concentrate version of the, uh, of, of the paint mixture, pulled down with the squeegee, blotted. Really, there's, I'm experimenting constantly. I'll do four of these a day and I have binders of them by this point. And I would say 90% of them, no, 80% of them are nothing special and 20% start doing what, what resonates in me. But look how landscapey this looks. And really it is just squeegee marks. It's, it's amazing to me. Do I begin with dampened paper? Sometimes, Marianne, um, Laura and us are the two colors or just one. In all of these, there are two colors of ink mixed together in different concentrations. I am really experimenting at this stage, so it's not like I've got a formula. I am trying to, I'm trying to expand my, my toolkit, as it were. Uh, yeah, Lauren, especially with the smoke today, and anyone in the eastern U.S., we're getting all this smoke from Canadian wildfires, and this sort of is what it all looks like. All right. Hi. Well, hi, Geraldine from Montana. It's nice to have you watching for the first time. All right. Next slide, please, Charles. Oh, this was a nice one. This is on Rembrandt watercolor paper. And when I say this is a nice one, ladies and gentlemen, I am not saying I'm so smart. All I'm saying is it's, it's, it's an amazing process. This one, look at how the, the drawing across of the ink, obviously the paper was wetter over there on the right, and then it was really wet in the center where it blooms, and then it was very dry over there on the left where that draw line of the ink is absolutely stark. That to me, that transition and the brush marks that are left, the ghost marks on the left in the quote unquote sky area are fascinating. And the there was there was some junk in the uh, in the in the water that I was using to to as my brush in the sky before I put the brush mark, the inky brush mark down. There was some bits of debris and that are, that leaves the little marks over on the right-hand side that I like. I like accidents that happen uh, rather than it being too controlled. Uh, so that's a very smooth, that's a block of smooth Rembrandt watercolor paper. This, is, this one, I took the big wide brush, right? had a diluted mixture of the black and brown, uh, brushed that across. Remember I had the squeegee, I have the squeegee. The squeegee is, is the barrier at the bottom, keeping the, the land area super white, right? Then I did the brush. I think I then took the spray bottle and sprayed across and got that beautiful bloom over on the left. Um, a little overworked maybe with the the uh, amount of mark making in the foreground, but it has some very nice textures to it. Um, can I speak to, I know it, I know might get to it, have to go. Can I speak to Binder? Lauren, oh, by, oh, oh, what I put them in? Just big, big loose leaf, big loose leaf notebooks that I punch. I've got a hole puncher and I punch holes in one piece of the paper, if that's the question you mean. And then I put that, that becomes one of the binders. Binders and binders of watercolors. Um, how do I feel about the irregular outside edges? I like them. I, I like all of this possibility. Um, oh, no, the acrylic. Okay, Lauren is asking about the acrylic binder. Am I using that? No, I'm just using that as a water container. The acrylic binder does not have a role in this process at all. It has a role in applying muslin to gator board. Uh, that's what I use it for. And then when, the, when it is empty, I use it uh, as a nice big plastic water container. Um, how do I feel about the irregular outside edges? 
I like them. They are a definite, uh, it's a definite look. I don't think this in and of itself on this particular one, I don't think it inherently adds anything, but I really like how the bottom band, how you can see that there are one, two, three, four, five, maybe four, four maybe passes with the brush. I like how that bottom one has a definite edge on the right uh, and, that, and the rest of it doesn't. I mean, it, it has this wonderful photographic versus, it looks like emulsion, it looks like photographic emulsion brushed onto a, a plate or something. Um, let's see, fairly new subscriber, I've been catching up on older videos. Excellent, Tambo, glad you're here. Next slide, please, Charles. This one is done with oil paint. Same thing, big squeegee at the bottom, right? So that's protecting the, the surface. This surface is, it's some thin, uh, you know, paint board, not a canvas board, but it's a paint board that has additional coats of gesso on it. Uh, so the, the big squeegee is put across the bottom. The top is wet. Uh, the line of, of ink, in this case, it is water mixable oil, Van Dyke, my, my trusty Van Dyke Brown uh, with a little bit of, uh, that may be pure Van Dyke Brown. Um, and then I pull up with the squeegee and it does that interesting effects on the sky and then it sort of bled down on the bot up, up at the top. Um, fascinating looking. And notice how the Van Dyke Brown precipitates out as it dries. This is one of the interesting things that water mixable oil does. The bluish part of the Van Dyke Brown settles. The orangey part of the Van Dyke Brown floats. And so if you, if you then, if you put the marks down and then mani manipulate them slightly, the orange is moving around for a lot longer than the than the bluish part. Um, and again, I'm not trying for a specific effect here. I'm wanting to see the magic happen. And it's it's like my friend Garnet Rogers, great Canadian songwriter, Stan Rogers, for those of you who know who know Canadian folk music of the 1980s, Stan Rogers was his brother. But Garnet has gone on to do wonderful music as well. But Garnet describes songwriting as going to work every day, trudging to the top of the hill with two pieces of bread and standing with your arms outstretched, hoping to catch a lightning sandwich. Uh, and that's sort of what this process is. You know, we're just trying different things to see what happens. Um, yeah, Lauren, I think that is one of the ones that you've got. A bunch of these were done, ladies and gentlemen, during the um, Friar Hunter gathering uh, a couple of weeks ago. Um, that's where I got back into this in a big way. And Lauren was one of the participants and she liked this one and she bought it by gum. Here's another one. This one, I believe, is the one that Uncle Doug got. Um, this is we, this is probably about three inches by seven inches. Um, again, it is the uh, Van Dyke Brown. Uh, water mixable oil. No, it's not. Nope. It is the uh, black and uh, burnt umber um, acrylic ink, but it is on a gessoed uh, a muslin on gator board gessoed. So it has that texture. And it's that process of putting the big squeegee down, the brush of the paint, then wetting the surface above letting the bleed, the bloom happen and basically getting out of the way of it. So beautiful, I think, so beautiful. So now I'll make my head big again. Um, that is basically the, the, the experimentations that I've been going through recently. And I really would encourage anyone to do the same thing. Um, 
just take some materials that you have. I'm going to go bouncing back very quickly to the beginning so you can see. Just take the materials you have and experiment with them. Don't just try to make, at least I think it's very interesting, not just trying to make the same thing over and over again. The huge squeegee is used as the, uh, basically as the frisket and as a straight edge. And then the smaller squeegees are used to manipulate the ink on top of it. Uh, does that one have muslin or just the gator board? The un Uncle Doug one, it has muslin. If it, if it had just the gator board, it wouldn't have that kind of uh, slight nibbly texture that the muslin uh, gives. If you just gesso gator board, it's more like the one that Lauren has. All right, that's about it. Yes, yes, Tambo. It, it, it says some of the, some remind me of old negatives. Um, that's the feeling, that's, that's where it's residing or resonating with me. And I would love it if, if any of you watching this uh, are so moved to try experimentations. I would love it if you would uh, send them to me. Um, I'd love to see what you're up to. And maybe we'll do a maybe we'll do a reasonably fine art talk where we show some of those, and I do a little crit session. How about that? All right, ladies and gentlemen, I've kept it down to 26 and a half minutes. I think that's pretty darn good. Thank you for joining us. And we'll be back next week, probably back next week, because I'm, no, next week, I may be on my way to Mountain Maryland. Depends how early a start I get. All right. Anyway, we'll be back soon with more Reasonably Fine Art Talks. Thanks so much for joining us. Take good care. Bye-bye.